Hello and welcome to Southside Sunday School. I'm Joe Farless. We'll be uh, leading in our lesson today. We will be in the book of Isaiah and in the book of Matthew today. So Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. We're going to be looking at one verse of scripture. Uh, actually a, a few verses um, there in, the, in another uh, chapter as well as we go on. But for the most part, um, we'll be in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, and then we're going to turn over to Matthew chapter 1 and be looking at verses 18 down through 25. Um, <clears throat> we're filming this a couple of days before Christmas, and I uh, hope and pray that you all have had a safe and wonderful holiday. You know, we have... Uh, Special times at Christmas. Each each family has its own special traditions. Uh, some of them overlap with uh, with Thanksgiving, as far as family and friends all getting together. Uh, but there was one um, event that caused a, a very unique memory uh, that we tie to Christmas, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about the. Um, the salvation expressed in God's name. And we're going to talk, be talking about the ultimate uh, representation of the love of God and uh, how He loved the world and sent His only begotten Son. So, uh, before we start uh, or go any farther, let's, uh, let's join our hearts in a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for your love and guidance. We thank you for your goodness, Father. We thank you for your uh, unfailing compassion, Father, and the mercy that you cover us with each and every day. Thank you, Father, for this time of year where we can just stop everything, even as busy as we are, Father, in our hearts and in our minds. Just enjoy the time of the season, the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a miraculous thing, Father, and it causes sometimes, uh, sometimes causes us to wonder. Uh, but that wonder is backed up by faith, faith, Father, uh, from your Holy Spirit, as He blesses us with that. As we look at these scriptures today, Father, help us to rekindle that fire uh, once again uh, that we had at the moment of our salvation when we understood. Jesus is the Savior of the world. So, Father, as we go through these scriptures, um, I pray, Father, that you glorify your name, um, that you uh, show us once again uh, the love that you have for us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What's your favorite Christmas memory? Perhaps it's gathering with family. Perhaps it's a uh, uh, special food that you get. Perhaps it's the exchange of, of gifts. Perhaps having um, uh, friends over. Uh, perhaps it's a destination uh, that you take every year or one that you take in one time. So we study our lesson today um, as, I, as you heard me say in the prayer uh, preceding this, is that uh, uh, I hope God takes us back, back to the point of our salvation when we accepted Christ and understood, even in our most infantile way, that He was our Savior, that He was our Lord. Um, and then we strive each and every day to make Him a little bit more like our Lord. It doesn't change who He is, only that we come into a broader and um, truer understanding of who Christ is. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, we see the first announcement of the coming of our Lord and Savior. A little background to this is that uh, our lesson writer writes, there are no atheists in foxholes. 
This saying describes how the threat of death causes soldiers to call on God. It's also a simple way of saying people tend to grab hold of faith when facing severe difficulties. Trusting God in times of trouble is not a bad thing, nor does it discount faith validity. God often brings us into dire situations to help us realize our desperate need for his salvation. King Ahaz of Judah was in just such a position. The armies of Aram, or what we know as modern-day Syria, and Ephraim, the northern tribes of Israel, were preparing to invade Judah, the southern tribe. These massive forces might overwhelm Jerusalem, and if so, Ahaz probably would be killed. Into this frightening setting, God sent the prophet Isaiah with a message for the king and his people. Therefore, the scripture says, the Lord himself will give you a sign. See, the virgin will conceive, have a son, and name him Emmanuel. Did you ever think about that scripture being in the Old Testament? wasn't just a pronouncement of something that was going to happen in the future, although that's how we understand it and that's how we know it. It's a pronouncement of Jesus' birth. But the setting for Isaiah in chapter 7, and uh, specifically in verse 14, uh, what had been going on is that, is that the Assyrians were under the leadership of a king and had begun to move westward from uh, Assyria toward the region of Israel and Judah. And King Pekah of Israel formed an alliance with Syria and Gaza against the encroaching Assyrians and invited King Ahaz of Judah to join the alliance, but he refused. So the two kings, that one of Israel and um, the one of Syria, joined forces and began to seize Judah themselves. Their goal was to remove Ahaz from power and install a puppet king who would bow to their wishes. Now the Lord sent Isaiah to Ahaz with a word of prophecy uh, that the coalition of the kings would not be successful against Judah. Through his prophet, God encouraged Ahaz to ask for a sign, but Ahaz refused. Ahaz refused under the false pretense of not wanting to test the Lord. But the Lord saw through this, saw through his motives. And Isaiah foretold the downfall of the king in his house. Because Ahaz, Ahaz feared Assyria more than the Lord, he called on the king of Assyria to help him win the battle against Syria and Israel. The purpose of Isaiah in this Old Testament property, property, prophecy often has near fulfillment and far fulfillment uh, aspects. We're more familiar with the far fulfillment aspects of this um, or a shadowing of things to come. Isaiah's prophecy is a perfect example of this shadowing as it spoke uh, to the time of Ahaz, but it is quoted in Matthew to describe the time of Jesus' birth in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, which we'll get to in just a moment. He said, The Lord himself will give you a sign. The sign points to something. Through Isaiah, the Lord encouraged King Ahaz of Judah to ask for a sign that the uh, Israelite-Syrian alliance besieging Judah would, uh, would fail. But the faithless king refused. So he said, see. That means to pay attention. The virgin will conceive. The news that Isaiah had for Ahaz was that a virgin would, be, uh, would become pregnant with child. 
Isaiah's prophecy, prophecy does not reveal the identity of this virgin. And the, the word does not require. Uh, well, it, the, the word virgin typically means a young woman of marriageable age. The word does not require in the near, near fulfillment of this prophecy that the woman in Isaiah's time would be a virgin who, uh, who would have a child. However, in quoting this passage in Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, Matthew clearly indicates that this is uh, a woman referred to as a virgin, is a virgin, who would through the working of the Holy Spirit conceive and bear a son that would, who is God's Messiah. Isaiah's prophecy does not reveal the identity of the son. The son may refer to a future king of the uh, the Vedic line and indicate that God was uh, still in the kings, was still with the kings of David's dynasty in the midst of threats. Such a sign would give hope to the king who trusted God. It would be a constant threat to the one who followed this strategy. Another possibility is that the son refers to Isaiah's son. His name means quick to plunder, swift to spoil. Perhaps he was going to raise Isaiah's son up to be um, this savior of the kingdom at that time. The name along with the Lord's spoken word foretold of the impending destruction of Syria and Israel. It was a call of faith, faith in King Ahaz to trust the Lord. However, Ahaz failed to trust the Lord. And through Isaiah, the Lord predicted the downfall of Ahaz and his house. Faithless Ahaz appealed to the Assyrian king for help. And Assyria, and Assyria defeated Syria. In 732 B.C. and Israel in 722 B.C., Judah survived the, the Assyrian assault and remained until uh, 586 B.C. when they were decimated by Babylon. And they will name him Emmanuel. This means God with us. God could have in Isaiah's time raised up an individual, born of a virgin, a son, who would save the people from that current situation that he was in. His name would be God with us. But that's not what Ahaz did. I turn to Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. While you're turning there, Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. The writer ends up this first uh, section with God was using his promise of Emmanuel to assure Ahaz that he is with us. More than a general sense of God's presence, Emmanuel would, act, would be an actual person who was human and divine at the same time. The Apostle John described how the eternal Christ took on flesh and was seen, touched, and experienced. He goes on to say, we may face frightening challenges in our life. Sometimes the enemy is not an invading army, but an incursion of a deadly virus. Our foe may be economic disaster, physical affliction, emotional distress, intellectual doubt. Like Ahaz, we can't imagine how we can survive the on onslaught of such overwhelming odds. We too are tempted to question God's love and trustworthiness. Our hope must be in Emmanuel. God initiated Judah's salvation in ours. Jesus is God with us. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. Hundreds of years after Isaiah's encounter with Ahaz, God promised of, of the Messiah came to pass. Most of us would like God to make things happen more quickly, but God is always on time. The Apostle Paul wrote, When the time came to completion, God sent His Son, born under the law. Galatians 4.4 4. How 
Let someone be the son of God and also the son of a woman. Matthew introduced the miracle simply. The birth of Jesus came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Birth. The word used for birth in the Hebrew language um, it's the same word for genealogy. The first verse of Matthew's Gospel, the incarnate Son of God would come into the world in the same way every other person does. As Isaiah had predicted, hope would come as the child was born into the world. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. It's a bold statement. A bold statement. Jewish practice. It was known as betrothal, which was as binding as the actual marriage. It would usually last about a year. During that time, the engaged woman would remain with her parents until the marriage was official and ready to be consummated. During the betrothal period, Jewish law required the couple to remain chaste. It's evidenced by the phrase before they came together. This restriction would challenge the relationship when Joseph discovered that Mary was pregnant before the marriage had been consummated. Though Mary knew that she was pregnant by a supernatural act of the Holy Spirit, Joseph did not at this time. As God, had not, God had revealed to Mary that she would have a child even though she had not yet had sexual relations with the man. This passage contrasts greatly with the crude pagan tales of deities physically coming down to earth to have sexual relation with human beings. The false god, Greek god Zeus, for instance. Mary was pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit, and this is important. Because Jesus had God as a father and Mary as a mother. He was fully human, but at the same time was wholly divine. The virgin conception explains how Jesus is, God's, is God incarnate. The Word made flesh. See John chapter 1 for more on that. Because they were betrothed, betrothed, Jewish law still considered Joseph as Mary's husband. If Joseph did not want to marry Mary, it required a certificate of divorce to legally end this relationship. He was a righteous man, it was said. He was law-abiding, upright in character, generally obedient, faithful to law, God's commands. The Jewish law gave him two options. To publicly humiliate Mary, which could actually lead to stoning, or to quietly divorce her, or divorce her privately. Since Joseph did not want to disgrace Mary publicly, Rather, he favored the choice of divorcing her privately. Joseph took the time to think about this, to deliberately plan it. He was hurt, understandably. He did not understand everything that was going on. He considered these things. After he considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Angel of the Lord created beings with a purpose. Their only purpose is to serve the wishes of God. To carry out His will. They were messengers. Joseph had many reasons to fear at this point. His betrothed wife was pregnant before their marriage. It would bring public ridicule, shame. 
His failure to divorce her would most likely have been viewed as a confirmation that Joseph and Mary had acted in a sexually immoral manner before they were officially married. It caused a great deal of, of um, ostronation, uh, if you will. They, they, would, they would be pushed aside. They would be talked about. They would be ridiculed. Their righteousness would be called into question and their good standing would be would dissolve. But the angel reassured Joseph that Mary's pregnancy was part of God's plan. The reason Joseph did not need to fear was that the child being conceived in her was by the power of the Holy Spirit. She would give birth to a son, which is a direct allusion to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. The name Jesus is the version of the Hebrew name Joshua, which means Yahweh saves. The Old Testament description of Messiah included the idea that the Messiah would save people from their sins. However, this was not the predominant first century view that the Messiah, what, of what the Messiah would do. Many people understood the Messiah, that Jesus would come to save them from uh, Roman occupation and their rule over their life. More than once, Jesus had to deal with this misconception of who he was as Messiah. Now all of this took place to fulfill which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but did not have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son and named him Jesus. Jesus was the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, regardless of various arguments over its context and terminology. Only Jesus fulfills the name Emmanuel, God with us. While the context fits the contemporary setting of Isaiah and Ahaz, the messianic reference directs us toward the one who would be Emmanuel, who would be God with us. See, it had an application there with Ahaz, but it has an application for us seven centuries later, 700 years later. Human attempts at rationalizing the divine miracle of the virgin birth fall short of in the evidence that Jesus' mother had never had sexual relations until after she gave birth to Jesus. He was conceived through the miraculous intervention of God, the Holy Spirit. The prophet. Matthew, Matthew used Isaiah and the dual fulfillment of that prophecy to explain the birth of Jesus. Like I said a minute ago, written 700 years before the birth of Jesus. Isaiah has spoken to in his own time about the birth of a child as a sign of God's deliverance to the people of Judah. Now the virgin birth was a sign of the coming in the promised Messiah. Quotation in Matthew's Gospel reflects closely the wording of the Septuagint, or the Greek translation of the Old Testament, written between the 3rd and the 1st centuries B.C. Much debate has centered on the use of the word virgin. The Hebrew word refers to a woman of marriageable age, but not necessarily a virgin. Most times it did refer to a virgin, but not always. Could have referred to just a young woman. The Greek word, though, exclusively indicates no prior sexual relationship, and that's the word used here. It's a miraculous thing, much debated. In Ahaz's time, the mother was a young woman, but not a virgin. Mary was both a young woman and a virgin. Twice in this passage, she emphasized. Uh, twice this passage emphasizes that Mary had not yet had sexual relations. Virgin birth is a crucial doctrine that indicates the full deity and full humanity of Jesus, his father. 
His father was Jesus. His father was God. His mother was Mary. I could just talk for just a moment. This is the foundation, not necessarily of our faith, but our coming to understand who Jesus was. It's a miraculous thing. And on our own, we cannot fully imagine nor make sense of, of anything coming close to this language. But in faith, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God has given us an understanding, a realization in our life that we could not do anything without Him. At the point of our conversion, from being a sinner without hope, placing all of our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, God's Holy Spirit has led us the whole way. Through Isaiah 7.14, or though Isaiah 7.14 revealed that Emmanuel would come during the prophet's own time, it was not the ultimate fulfillment of that capacity. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7 explained it better. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You will multiply the nation. You will increase their joy. They will rejoice in your presence. As with the joy of harvest, as people rejoice when they divide the spoils. For you will break the yoke of the burden and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors, says at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the marching warrior and the roar of battle and the cloak um, and cloak rolled in blood will be for burning fuel for the fire. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over the kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. The Lord sends a message against Jacob, and it falls on Israel, and all the people know it. That is, Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria asserting his pride and the arrogance of heart. There will be no end to the increase of his government or peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom. To establish and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. And that's exactly what God did through the birth of Jesus. So Joseph married her. He did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he completed the process of marriage with one exception. He did not have relationships with Mary until after Jesus was born. And as scripture says that, that um, uh, Jesus had many brothers, and he had sisters as well. Joseph obeyed God by naming the child Jesus. He did not choose a family name. The angel had informed Joseph of the reason the baby was to be named Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Our time's running out. Uh, let's pray before we go. Our Father, we thank you for your love and guidance. And we thank you for the miracle of this birth. How it was proclaimed in the Old Testament, Father, and followed up in the New. We can't understand this with our human reasoning, Father. It makes no sense to us. But, Father, with an eye of faith, with the power of your Holy Spirit living in our life, we can. We can understand this to a point where it brings us to the point of salvation, where we accept Jesus' birth and his death on the cross, his payment for our sins point us to a right relationship with you. We give you all praise and glory for this, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.